the 15th chapter. We're going to read verses uh, uh, 17 through 23. 1 Samuel 15, 17 through 23. I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version uh, this morning. I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version. And the words recorded, Samuel said, Is it not true that even though you were small, insignificant in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribe of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go totally destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are eliminated. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but instead swooped down on the plunder with shouts of victory and did evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone on the mission which the Lord has sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have completely destroyed the Amalekites. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but instead swooped down on the plunder with shouts of victory and did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul had said to Samuel again, I had obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone down on the mission. The Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of the Amalekite, and have completely destroyed the Amalekites. Samuel says, for rebellion is serious as the sin of divination, fortune telling, and disobedience as serious as the false religion and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you as king. So our empowering thought today is obedience is better than sacrifice. Tell somebody obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, today's message is going to be a spiritual lesson and a life lesson. So you're not only going to be able to use this spiritually, but you're going to be able to use this message through your daily walk, your daily life events. But before I can deal with our empowering thought, I must first set the story and, and so we can get to the point in our text where we are, uh, where Samuel is talking to Saul, Saul, who is the king of Israel. So I'd have to go all the way back to uh, uh, chapter 8 of 1 Samuel. Uh, Samuel had two sons, and he appointed his sons as rulers of uh, Israel over, uh, uh, leaders over Israel. And, and what happened was those two sons uh, did not follow the ways of Samuel. And so they turn aside and, and instead of using the pulpit or uh, the position of prophet to, to, to bless the people, they took uh, uh, the position and made it dishonest. They started accepting bribes and and, and they perverted justice, or they towed the scales of um, justice in the favor of whoever would give them the most. Because of this, the children of Israel began to murmur and complain. They wanted a king. And, 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 and so this grieved Samuel because they wanted a king. And so uh, uh, Samuel goes to God and say, look, they want a king. And God says, well, give them what they want. So Samuel wasn't settled in his spirit with that. So he went back to the people and told the people again, you want a king, but this, you want a king, 
this is what the king is going to do to you. And the people say, yeah, but we want a king anyway. It's better than you two Jack Lake sons. So we want a king anyway. And so Samuel goes back to God and say, God, they are still saying the same thing. And God says, give them what they want. They want a king, give them a king. And so God chooses Saul. Saul, he is from one of the smallest tribes of Israel called the Benjamites. And, and, and Samuel goes to anoint Saul as king. But before he, 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 before he tells Saul that he's going to be appointed as king, he gives Saul all of these steps he has to do. He has to carry out. So Saul uh, uh, goes and, and, and he leaves Samuel. Verse chapter 10, verse 9 says, And God changed Saul's heart, and the Spirit of God came upon him powerfully. Now, Saul did all the things that Samuel told him he had to do, and as the process of the steps, or the uh, process of the things that Samuel had to do, as Saul tackled each step, the next thing came. But not till he completed the steps did the anointing come. You follow me? So he followed the steps and the anointing of the power of God fell on him mightily. Now, when the Spirit of God fell on him, he went back home to his father. And his uncle says, well, where were you? We were looking for the donkeys. He said, yeah, but you didn't find him. So what happened? Well, we saw this man of God. Uh, they call him a seer. Uh, uh, a seer is just like those who do divinations, but they used to call a man of God the same thing back in the same day. Uh, so they call a seer, he, and his name was Samuel, and he told us where the uncle was. Now, his uncle said, yeah, what else he told you? Nothing. Now, mind you, Samuel just anointed him king of Israel. And when his uncle said, what else did he tell you? He said, nothing. And he goes back to his father's, tending his father's fields. Now, Samuel just anointed you king. You know there's a day of appointment coming, and you go back to the fields of your father. Y'all with me? Now, the day of his appointment comes. And as instructed, Samuel brings out all the tribes of Israel there in order. And he goes from the greatest to the smallest. And the last one is Benjamites. And he goes through and he comes through to appoint Saul as king. And he gets there, and guess what? Saul is nowhere to be found. So the man says, well, let's inquire of God to see where he is. Saul is hiding amongst the supplies. So the men have to go get him and bring him out to be anointed king. So he's anointed king. An appointed king. Let me go back to our text because I want you to hear what Samuel says to him. He says, is it not true that even though you were small and insignificant in your own eyes, God set you upon the tribes of Israel? In his own eyes, Although the things, the steps he carried out, the anointing was on him, he still thought he was insignificant. 
he still thought he wasn't worthy. He still thought, so much so, not only did he go to his father's field, but he hid in the supplies. Now, that's a scared man. And so when we look at what is happening, we find now we'll get to, to where our text is about. Let me go to chapter 13 first. After Saul was king, he had this victory. And what happens after the victory, Samuel would come and he would sacrifice the, the, the rams and the bullocks to God in honor of the victory. Well, this particular victory, Samuel was delayed seven days. And Saul said, well, he delayed. I'll just do the offering myself. And so he went and did the offering himself. Samuel comes on that seven day right after he burnt the offering and said, what you doing? He said, well, you know, you was delayed and the man, the, 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 my, my warriors were getting a little skittish. So I made the sacrifice to God for you. And Samuel looks at him and said, you did. Okay. He said, let me tell you what God told me last night. You're going to lose your kingdom. Now, Saul says, well, forgive me, man. I messed up. I'm, you know, I'm good. Now. Samuel said, yeah, okay. You're good. Two chapters later, we are in chapter 15. God gives the rule, the law. Tell Saul to destroy the Amalekites. Kill everything. Man, woman, children, beasts. I don't care if it make a sound, destroy it. Saul goes. And he doesn't do it. He leaves the king. And he took the best of the spoils for themselves. Samuel comes and say, Saul, what are you doing? So I said, yeah, I did just what the Lord told me. He said, well, how come I hear sheep's bleating? How come I smell some stuff that I shouldn't smell? He said, well, you know, we kept the king and, and we kept the best animals so you, so, so you can sacrifice to the Lord your God. Wait a minute. He appointed you king and now he's my God and not yours? So, said, mm-hmm. Then we get to where he says, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as an obedience to the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better to obey than to sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So now let's talk about this, because when we look at it on the surface, we don't really see the issues. The first issue was Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. He sacrificed versus being obedient. We go back to chapter 13. What did he do? He sacrificed in Samuel's stead. Who was Saul? King. Now, he couldn't even do his kingly duties. But he crossed over in Samuel's lane to do Samuel's duty. And this is where the obedience comes in. He said, Saul, I appointed you to be king. And you couldn't even do that. All you had to do is rule the people. But you want to be the priest. I didn't anoint you to be the priest. I anointed you to be the king. So what does that mean for us? You are anointed for a specific thing. Get out of somebody else's lane. You are not the pastor. I'm the pastor. But guess what? I'm not the deacon. So it is not my job to do any of their jobs. 
even if I don't see them doing it. Are y'all with me? So we talk about obedience now. So, 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 so let me teach you about the importance of obedience or being led by the Spirit. Because there is it. We have to distinguish being led by the Spirit and being us. Are you following me? Because there's a difference. There are some things us say, and there are some things the Spirit say. I didn't say that, but you did it anyway. You follow me? And you have to be clear on those things because when you are being led by the Spirit, you are walking in obedience. But when you cross the us stuff and say, I did this in the name of Jesus, you are in disobedience. Okay. So the Bible, uh, the biblical definition of obedience is defined as the dutiful of submissive compliance to the command of one in authority. So dutiful means it is our obligation to obey. Just as Jesus fulfilled his duty uh, uh, by dying on the cross, it is our obligation to obey what the word says. Submissive mean indicate that we yield our wills to God's will. The commands mean that it's talking about the scriptures. God has clearly given us the instructions so that we could be successful in this life. There's only one authority, and that's God. Tell somebody there's only one authority. I don't want to mess with your theology this morning, but that one authority goes by many names. But it's only, only one authority, only one God. He goes by many names. What you call him is not necessarily what somebody else may call him. But it doesn't mean that he's not God. It means that they call him something different than, and, and matter of fact, he told Moses, he says, well, Moses said, well, who I'm going to tell him sin? He said, I am. And who is I am? Whatever you want him to be, whatever you name him to be, that's who he is. There's only one power. And so for the believer, obedience means complying to everything that God has commanded. It is our duty to do so. so. So what does obedience really mean? It means that you are practicing a lifestyle. That's what obedience means. Practicing a lifestyle. You are putting your thoughts into practice. Are you on with me? Uh, 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 you know that saying we say practice make perfect practice make perfect so obedience means i am putting the word of god into action i am practicing what i have been taught what i've read what have been revealed to me i'm practicing that and so with the practicing of that that means you have to have a repetitive action tell somebody got to be repetitive action you can do it one time it has to be a repetitive action, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Are y'all following me? So you can't do it one time, and for most of us, what we do, do it one time, it doesn't work, and then we what? Quit. Find something else to do. No. It is a repetitive. So that's why uh, when you look at sports, they are so successful because they are doing it repetitively. You follow me? L let me let me make it even clearer to you because sports is the, the best analogy for being obedient. You learn the plays, right? You are studying those plays and you're learning those plays. And when a uh, great thing would be when a quarterback goes back to throw the ball and it's a blitz coming, he has the play. He's running the play. 
he see the defensive guy coming and he throws the ball. And they said, boom, oh, touchdown, wow, wow. Because what was the play? I did my part of the play. You did your part of the play and you caught the ball. So if the quarterback is not obedient and he changes the play and don't tell you, he's going to get hit. Y'all follow me? So obedience means repetition. So much so to where you can do it with your eyes closed. Come on, somebody. And so when we say, I don't know if I'm in God's will, there's a problem with that statement. How do you not know if you are obedient to the word? You have to know. God's word is not a secret. It is for all of us to be successful and blessed. So if one person can do it, you have to make up in your mind that I can do it too. So listen to this. So, so what happened to Saul? Because this is important. There were two things that caused Saul his kingdom, and it affects us the same way. The first thing was what he thought about himself. The second thing is what he thought the people thought about him. Those two things, what he thought about himself and what he was thinking you were thinking about him. Have you found yourself in your stinking thinking about yourself and you have sabotaged your own efforts for success? Have you done it? Nobody else done it. We blame other people. But truly, it's your thinking about yourself. You have sabotaged your own success. Uh, but yet, have you found yourself so wrapped up into what people think, you find yourself working to please them and forget all about what God called you to do? Those were the two things that cost Saul his kingdom. When, you, when your thinking is influenced by wrong thoughts, you start sacrificing, which means you start getting sloppy, crossing the line. You start compromising. You start getting in other people's lane. So when I say wrong thoughts, I mean not only your thoughts, but you being influenced around people who think they are helping you. So they're not doing it to, to mess you up. They're doing it with a good heart. They think they are actually helping you. But the truth of the matter, they are not helping you. They are setting you up for a big fall. Are you following me? Girl, you can do it. You can. Is it the time? So in other words, I'm not saying that it is wrong. I'm saying it might not be the time. But then there are some influences just out, out, wrong. Tell them it's just out, wrong. Just flat out, wrong. And you know it. But because they are signifying your little stuff, I'm jumping on this. Because, you know, you might never get another opportunity. Wait a minute. I got all the blessings of God, are yea. So this opportunity, if I'm not ready for it, is not my opportunity. I'm not jumping on it because I don't think there might be another one. Then I'm not walking in faith. Because if I'm walking in faith and that is truly the desire of my heart, if I'm not ready for it, God is going to bring it back around. See, when you get obedient, then you kind of get a little flat-footed and solid. The wind don't toss you no more. You get a strong breeze, but you come right back. 
They said, oh, I almost fell for it. You almost got me. You almost got me. But something inside of me is telling me, don't you move. But we are so used to the outside influences when the spirit tell us not to move and somebody tell us to move, we move. The spirit said, I told you not to move. Get back where you're supposed to be. Say, well, it's going to be hard now. Yes, you made it hard. I was setting you up for grace and ease. But since you want to step on to the left, go and step on over there. But yeah, it's going to be hard to work you back because I didn't put you over there. Are y'all with me? So, 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 so the church used the word sacrifice out of order. See, see, girl, I made a sacrifice to be here today. Then you weren't being obedient. Right? So, so we use the word sacrifice as a blessing. And it's not. Because if you are obedient, you won't have to sacrifice. See, 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 I don't see when I'm on obedience, if you call a $500 line, it doesn't phase me because I'm a tither anyway. And because I'm a tither, he says, I've opened the windows of heaven and pull you out of blessing. You got so, so whatever is happening over here doesn't bother me because, because, because I'm obedient to what he already told me to be. You follow? So, so when somebody give a thousand dollars, that might be a sacrifice for them. Come on, somebody, because they weren't obedient giving the tithe all alone. So, so tell somebody, don't get. Don't get caught up in the sacrifice. So sacrifices mean doing what you think is necessary. See, that don't mean it's wrong. That just means you're doing what you think. Are y'all following me? Look, Saul was the king and he thought he should be the priest. Nobody told him to do it. He thought he should. Why? Because Samuel delayed. Isn't that how we do it in church? Well, ain't nobody doing it. I'm going to do it. Just because you see there's a spot that needs somebody and that don't mean you the spot. You have to get back. And remember, I'm being obedient to what he called me to do. Because see, the delay... Samuel's delay was purposeful because he had to so show Saul, you about to lose your stuff. You follow me? And sometimes when there's a gap in place, you need to leave the gap alone. See, in yourself, you may see the gap and say, well, I'm going to fill that gap just for the moment. And God is saying, I didn't tell you to do that. Because the gap is for a reason. And now you're going to put yourself in the midst of the reason. And so therefore you have to deal with the consequences of the reason. Come on, somebody. And what will it cost you? We do it in church all the time. Well, you know, they weren't here. So I'm going to do it. Whose job is it? Who was appointed to do that? And so now you're going to do something that will require you to use energy or expel energy that you shouldn't have to expel. And after you expel that energy, you're going to come to Bishop and see, see, they ain't even appreciate it. No, because you wasn't supposed to do it. Why? Because when you are anointed to do something, it makes it happen with grace and ease. Come on, someone. Now, 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 little lady said earlier that they're trying to figure out Nicole's salary. Now, that's a good place to be in. Come on, somebody. Now, now you know that's some grace and ease. You said, this is going to work out anyway. It you, you understand what I'm saying? Holy Spirit give you bargaining power. Now she has the ability when they set the paper down and say, I don't like that. Come on, somebody. 
You don't have to settle because in your obedient life, God is providing what you should have. You won't have to work hard because you're supposed to have it. So God is trying to give it to you. Come on, somebody. Some of us are working ourselves to the grave. Why? Because that's not what we should be. And we think we should be providing for ours. It is not my, that's God's responsibility. It's my job to have the desire. And so Saul was the king and nowhere in there did he, his story do you see him doing one kingly duty come on not one he reigned for 42 years not one so how do you get in your mind to do the priest duties when you don't even know what it entails? Come on, somebody. See, this, this, is, this is what we hear as preachers. I get up there and do that. You don't know. You don't know what it is to feel the pressure up here of giving a word from God that should change your life. You don't know I'm a husband I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a pastor. All of these things are pulling on my mind at the same time. And I got to get clear guidance for the Holy Spirit. You don't know. So it might look easy while I'm up here because it's supposed to. That's what the anointing does. That's what the anointing does. It's supposed to look like I'm gliding. Like, boy, Bishop can put that history together like nothing. Woo! It's supposed to work. That's what the anointing does. Tell somebody that's what the anointing does. If you are fighting in your walk, if you are fighting in your life to be who you're supposed to do, check yourself. Make sure you are where you're supposed to be because the anointing supposed to make this thing easy. As I complete, as I do it over and over and over, the anointing is giving me more power to make it even more masterful. It does not take away. So how do we live a life of obedience instead of sacrifice? That's what the church needs to understand. Quit sacrificing. That means you're all out of your lane. You're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing. Well, you know, it's a sacrifice to be at this revival. Why you go? Because why? The, the, the blessing, everything is done. You, you, you there for nothing. You wasting your time. You mad already anyway. Because you had to come. Nothing that you tell yourself. I was there Sunday. Lord, I'm tired today. I work hard today. The kids still got their schoolwork they got to do. They got this going on. I can't be at revival today. You ain't Jesus. The revival is not going to stop because you're not there. You think your two dollars gonna help that much? Come on. We have to be obedient to the spirit that is leading and guiding us. See, the church is used to sacrificing, that means being out of order, instead of being obedient. Sometimes spirit's gonna say, just sit down somewhere. Sit down. You don't need to go nowhere. Well, you know, you know, they're going to need me at church. What? How long the church been around? <laughs> that they need you so much and spirit telling you not to go. How much? Then on the flip side, let me make sure we understand that some of us are just lazy. And the spirit telling us to go 
Well, I'm going to watch it online tonight. Come on, somebody. We just lazy. And that is costing us our anointing because you are not walking in anything. You're just laying around, flopping around like a whale. Come on. Get into your life. Start doing something. Start participating. Start practicing your life. Well, you know, it was hard. It sure was because you ain't been in it for 20 years. It should hurt. It should be rough because finally you decide to participate in your own life and it didn't come easy. Why? Because for 20 years you was floating around doing nothing. Yeah, it's going to take some work because now you and spirit got to align yourself where you moving together. For 20 years, spirit was over here and you was over here. And so now the day you think you're going to be with spirit and everything's going to be groovy. And so, 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 so how do we live a life? The first thing you need to understand is obedience requires effort. Listen, this swings both ways. Obedience, you have to work at being obedient. Let me tell you something. I have to work at keeping the cussing spirit down. I have to work at that. 24 years in the Navy, there are just some words seem better than others. And when I'm preaching, them some words seem to come to want to jump on my lips. Now, some people say they're speaking in tongues, and I said I'm speaking in a known tongue because everybody understand them four-letter words, I would say. But sometimes it hits and it would work in the right spot in a sermon, but I have to hold back, <laughs> take a deep breath, look back at my iPad and get the right word. It takes work. It takes effort. You, you, your life is the, the life of God. It takes effort to walk upright before God. You walking out there, all kind of stuff is in your eyes. They call them eye candy. And all of us like sweet. Come on, somebody. And all of us like to dabble in the sweet. And ooh, that come on, somebody. And that eye candy can cause you, cause you. You have to be able to keep your eyes single and say, today I am dieting off of sweets. Come on, somebody. Not today. You might get me tomorrow, but today. I'm going to be obedient to my diet, which is the word of God. And I'm going to make it to the day by standing on the word of God and doing what he requires me. Tell somebody it takes effort. Whoo. Re repetition leads to mastery. You don't fall into the Olympics. Do you? They run all year. And different all over the world running. Just so at the end, they can try to be and make the Olympic team. Because only the best, those who have truly mastered, and this is the thing about obedience you have to understand. Obedience have nothing to do with your neighbor. Nothing. When you are running a race, you don't pay attention to who's in whatever lane's next to you. My focus is on what? The prize. Because if you have to look to your left or look to your right, you lost the race. Because they're focused on what? And so you have to learn to be master, a master of your calling. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. You know, there's not one preacher here that don't get butterflies when they stand up here. 
I still get them. I had them this morning. I said, I don't even know if I'm going to preach this. And when the medical emergency happened, I misread it. I said, ooh, thank you, God. I ain't going to have to preach today. Hallelujah. I misread it. And let me tell you how God was. Leading lady, look back. You ready to preach? We don't get no announcements. We don't get no sermonic selection. We don't get no offering for me to prepare. Get up there. Do it now. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I wasn't obedient and put in my practice of preparing this word, I would have looked at her and said, no. You do the announcements and you do all of that stuff because I need to prepare. No, it's too late. You understand what I mean? When you in the game, it's too late to practice. It is game. This is Super Bowl Sunday. You only get one chance at this. I only get one chance to share a word with you that will change your life. Because next week you can say, he was foolish. I'm not coming back. You follow me? So we only get one chance at this. And that's how you have to see your life. I get one chance at making this thing work. (laughs) And sometimes we forget. Because we think our lives are IOU. We, we we think our life, this is just a game. I'll get a naked chance. Uh, uh, sometimes we think we on a all-you-can-eat smorgasbord. You're not. Life is actually school or a proving ground. It is showing you or revealing your faith all the time. It is revealing your faith. When you get into a situation, it is revealing your faith. Either you're going to be obedient to spirit or you're going to decide your own way. Period. If spirit tell you, ride it out. Ride it out. Don't you get anxious to say, well, this is a little bumpy ride. I think I'm going to change cars. Ride it out. It's supposed to. The reason the Spirit is telling you to ride it out is because He already knows it's going to be bumpy. So, so what happens is we get out of uh, uh, life in relations to what you put into it. This is why you have to put some effort. If life is just sweeping past you, look at what you're putting in it. If you're getting what you expect, then you're in a good place. If you say, why should be doing a little better than this? Look at the effort you're putting into it. Look at what you're doing. And, 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 And I have to give leading lady credit because she has to deal with me. <laughs> Every Thursday evening-ish, Friday, Saturday-ish, my mind is running on the message. I'm retracing that message back through my mind. Okay, I need to add this, change this. To, now, nothing on paper yet. She's like, wait a minute, I'm your wife. Don't we get to go out? I'm working on the message. Every weekend, you working on the message. Can't God give you it on a Monday? Come on. Do you understand what I'm saying? But through my work ethic, I, don't, I can go drive three hours to a graduation sit there for a couple hours, drive three hours back while everybody in the car sleep except Deacon Donna. Y'all following me? Get home, sit down for a minute. The message is going through my mind. 
She said, well, what you going to do when you get home? I said, I'm going to sit next to my beautiful wife. And she said the magic word, and I'm going to be asleep. Yes. Because <laughs> you have to put into practice. See, when you put into practice, Holy Spirit is talking to you even though I'm standing here. Because Spirit knows that he, I can change up in the midst of the message, drop something on him, and he's going to keep his cool. Now, that wasn't so 10 years ago. Spirit would drop something on me, and I would stop. Mid-message, ain't nothing coming out. I'm just standing here. What? I'm not saying that. <laughs> But now, because spirit understand how I work and I understand how spirit work, I can do it. It takes repetitive action. Tell somebody it takes repetitive action. <laughs> you cannot think by osmosis your life is going to blossom. It's going to take work for you to go on any direction you choose. Listen, any direction you choose, you don't have to worry about, is this God will for me? He said, I'll direct your paths with an S. So any direction you choose, God is there directing your path. He cannot do it. He can't, can't do it. You follow me? Because he's in you. Spirit is in you. He can't, can't do it. So wherever you go, the spirit is always going to step up and lead you. So all you got to do is keep going. If you don't like the past, switch over. It's your choice. He said, whatever path you on, if you want to be on that path, I'm fine with it. Let's just master the path. Mm, 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 mm. Oh my God, my God. So, so I don't want you to think that we're dogs and we are begging to God's command. God doesn't work that way. We're not dogs. He made us individuals like him. So how you use your mind, you're being the creative person God created you to be. And therefore, however you use or uh, whatever you use your mind to create, God is in the business of manifesting. That's what he's in the business of. He don't care what you put your mind to create. He's in the business of manifesting. Why? Because when he manifests, he shows his love through you. So therefore, get to thinking something. And now saying, okay, God, look, I came up with this and, and, and this is what I want. Do you think God is going to tell you no? God's going to say, woo, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Now we get some juices flowing. And so now God is going to take your idea and manifest it through the work and sharpen your idea to with something that's worth manifesting. Let me, I'll give you an example. A Bible study, Elder Foster Granddaughter said, now, if God took the dust and made man, how did he breathe in him and he becomes a loving soul? Was he standing up? This is a six-year-old. I said, wow. So no, he formed on the ground and he breathed in tune. So what happens when God said everything came in, the brain started to work, the heart started to beat, the blood started to flow, the left side took care of the right side, the right side took care of the left side. You understand? What I'm the toes started to wiggle, the muscles started to say, uh, uh, uh. you follow me? Just because God said, now all of that was in his mind. You follow me? It was in his mind and in his breath, he said, and it became. So think about you in your mind may look like this. It might look like, you know, I used to see the little scrabble and you can't figure out what it is. 
Yes, it may look like that. But when you put your faith to it, when it becomes to the manifest, it comes out looking like. Oh, yo. <laughs> so the question becomes. Did I purposely or intentionally um, and actively put into practice what God has created me to do? Have I put, made, my, made my mind think? Come on, somebody. You got to make it think. Not just on the surface. You have to make it think deep. Book readers People who love to read understand when I say that. Because when you read a book, a book challenges your mind to go someplace that it hasn't been. So therefore, you have to challenge your mind. We are going someplace you have never been. And therefore, when we go there, not we just not going to see it and come back. We're going to grab hold so we can bring it forward and manifest it. That's how we have to think about our lives. Are y'all with me? You have to start thinking some stuff, some creative stuff. Don't think about a cell phone. Somebody already did that. And, and, and don't get scared with the 666. Well, you know, that's microchips and everything else. Well, you're going to go there sooner or later. That don't mean that's the 666. It means that they are doing what God created them to do to bear a result and enhance the result. You might be the one that put the microchip where Jarellas have to do this in the air. Ding, 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 and the, com the piano just plays in the wind. Now y'all said, now that's crazy. It's coming. Because we said that about cars. And here it is. Ain't none of us got a horse. The second thing to be obedient, tell somebody it requires focus. Oh my God. You have to be focused because if you're not, you're going to drift. Or you're going to be tempted in the wrong direction. So you got to get focused. When we focus, on how other people should change, we become blind to our own need to focus. Why? Because we are thinking about what you need to change. And I'm thinking about what you need to change and my life is all tore up. But because I'm not focused on my life, I can't see it. No, it's not that I can't see it. I choose not to deal with it. I'd rather deal with yours than to deal with myself. Why? Because I know how to fix you, but I'm not obedient to the practices to fix myself. Mm, mm, mm. Listen, so, so, so focus means, it, it, it just doesn't mean having clear vision or clarity. Focus means everything and me have to align with it. I'll give you an example. My focus is I'm working this job because I'm looking for a promotion. I can't come to work 15 minutes late every day. Because my focus is off. I got to be focused all the way through so that I can get what God is having. See, focus means that when God begins to bless me, I'm aware of how he's blessing me. And I'm not like Saul going back to my father's garden. Oh, let me make that plain for you. See, when God blesses you and open doors for you, you can't go forward if you keep going back. And let me make that even plainer for you. Because see, some of you, God has been a blessing to you and you won't let your past go. You won't let your behaviors go. You won't stop and say, oh, God, open all of these doors for me. 
I don't need this anymore. We try to do this and this and figure out why am I struggling? Why is life hard? Why is not coming with grace and ease? Because you won't let this go. And so God is tugging you this way and your past is tugging you this way. So you're expelling energy that's unnecessary. You're not broke. You broke because you want to be. God is trying to pull you into your future, but you keep going. You keep going back. You keep holding on. God is saying that you're going to run yourself to the ground. Let it go. I can't because I'm too scared. Yes. Fear is the problem let it go have i not supplied for you all along don't you think i got you moving forward how else you got where you got let it go tell somebody let it go it's time for some grace and ease my god my god my god my god and so you have to focus quit focusing on the now I don't have it. I don't have you right. You don't have it because you're looking at the noun and not the end product. If you look at the end product, you see you have it all. But you just gotta get there. If you're looking down, you can't see the finish line. Tell somebody quit looking down. Proverbs 13 12 says. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire come, it is a tree of life. God understands that you have hopes, right? You have dreams, you have desires, and when they're not fulfilled, it makes the heart sick. He goes on to say what? But when the desires come, when God manifests what you want, it's a tree of life. Why? Because now you can keep going further. But for some of us, even though we holding on to the tree of life, we keep going back to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Leave the tree of good and knowledge. of You got the tree of life. Let it go. Tell somebody, let it go. If you lose your focus on the seed, which is God's word, you're going to lose your life. We in church, so I can say this. <laughs> because every church suffers it. Everybody who is a part of a ministry in church, leaders or not, if you're a part of a ministry in church, you are part of that ministry. When God blesses you, don't deduct from your part of the ministry. Because God always gets second. What am I talking about? If I'm a preacher, and this is a true story, I am a preacher. Excuse me. And in my own mind, and I'll admit this to you, in my own way of doing things, excuse me, I decided I'm going to Kansas City. I decided that. The opportunity came. God didn't close the door, but that don't mean he opened it either. Come on, somebody. And when I got there, no, let me change that. Because the day I was to travel, all hell break loose. When I was supposed to be someplace at noon, I'm getting there at midnight. Tell somebody red flag. Wasn't good enough for me. I'm going to push the limits. Push it on all the way through. God said, this fool, I'm going to have to do something drastic 
to get him back. Now, mind you, all the signs were already shown. I came back home. And the next time, guess what? The same sign show. Late flights. Delayed. Oh, I can't even get a ride now. What? Oh, I got an Uber. Oh, my God. Where are you? Uber guy. Man, the airport. I don't even know where you at. I'll be there in a half hour. Oh, are you kidding? It's already midnight. Red flag. But what does Bishop do? I'm a walking on out. Because this is an opportunity and God's going to bless me. God said he ain't going to get it. So he shuts down the whole thing so I can come back. So what did Bishop do? I detracted from God to go do what I wanted to do. So in the meantime, the weight falls on leading lady. Now, she's anointed to preach and to be the assistant pastor. <laughs> but that's not her. I'm the pastor. You follow me? So my anointing doesn't go to her. She's using all of her anointing to keep this thing running while I play. And God said, enough is enough. You follow me? Now, I'm back on my place. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is when God blesses you, don't make God stuff secondary. Because if you're not here, somebody has to cover. Now, if you one of those people in ministry and don't do anything, that's a whole different story because you wasn't doing nothing to begin with. Somebody was always covering your stuff. You follow me? But that that, made, that means you've been sacrificing instead of being obedient. You got to be obedient. Tell somebody you got to get focused. And so when you focus, it's just like you're an anchor. Anybody knows an anchor? An anchor holds those big old aircraft carriers in one spot when they're out to sea. Now, they, when the wind and the tide moves, they spin around like this but they never leave the anchor. That's how you have to be. Life is going to spin you, move you around, but you have to know I'm stuck on my end goal. This is what I'm going to get, and that's all I'm thinking about. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care how you're doing. I'm focused on what. And some of times we get so caught up in what's happening when we're spinning in life, you're trying to move out of somebody's way. Ooh. Excuse me, that ain't none of my business. You better watch out because this is a big boat coming around and you don't want to deal with none of my stuff. You better move out of my way. I'm not moving out of your way. How am I moving out of your way in my life? How do we do that? My life and I'm moving out of your way. That doesn't even make sense. Because if you in your life and you, I'm in my life, we'll miss each time. Perfect example again. Wednesday we was here and the deacons were practicing uh, uh, communion. And so they wanted to, first they said, we're going to turn inside. But when they turn inside, they clink, clink, clink. You know, the, the trays click. So Deacon Cliff said, well, let's just spin to the outside. So they spin to the outside and they come around, boom, come around, boom, come, nothing. The anointing will keep you where you need to be. I don't have to worry about running into your life if I'm in my life. <laughs> so you have to focus on your stuff. Tell somebody, I got to focus on getting my stuff going. Oh, my God. <clears throat> and this is why this is important. He says, Hebrews 10, 35 says, therefore, cast away your, not your confidence. For this has great recompense of reward. You have need of endurance. You have need to practice. You need, you have to bull your lungs up to run the long race. Some of us take three steps and you, <laughs> give me some oxygen. Some of us need some exercise to make our lungs stronger. That's a, so listen, when you breathe out, you're breathing out. 
When you breathe in, you're breathing in. So when you breathe in, you're pulling God in because God had to breathe out so you can breathe in. So sometimes we don't use our lungs enough to get enough God in our lungs for us to be operate during the day. Sometimes you need to breathe more. Inhale more. And exhale all of that foolishness. Inhale the word of God and exhale all of that garbage out of you so that you could be what God has called you to be. The third thing. To obey requires patience. I heard somebody say, oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord, Jesus. Hallelujah. You need to add some more adjectives on that because we are impatient people. Lord, Galatians 6, 9 tells us that you can't get weary in well-doing. Psalms 119, 1 tells us that we are blessed when we stay the course. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 tells us that when we stay in a lane and keep running our ways, you will obtain the prize. Those are guarantees, three guarantees I gave us. Tell somebody you got to be patient. It is very difficult to be patient in today's world. When we bring our concerns to the Lord again and again, and when he is slow to respond, we get anxious. And then our flesh kicks in. I got to do this my way. Because God ain't moved yet. But just maybe he was teaching you patience. That's why he delayed. To see if you're going to stand in your faith. Or whether you're going to shift to yourself. It's difficult. We pray, and, and sometimes we feel like our prayers are falling on deaf ears, that God don't hear. You, he couldn't have heard me because I've been praying all week, and there ain't nothing happened yet. And so what do we do? We go back to option number two. There should never be an option two when you walk in faith. It's either this way or no way. You should not make options when you're walking in faith. If you ask God for something, you ask God for it. Now, what you have to remember is you don't determine the outcome. God determines the outcome. You just say, I asked for it. And since I asked for it, there's no options. I just want what's rightfully mine. You have to let your patience rescue you when your faith is being revealed. That's a, we call a hashtag. You have to let your patience rescue you when your faith is being revealed. When you're in the fire, our mind tells us, do something. Patience tell your faith, Stand still. Let it work itself out. Just because you're uncomfortable, it doesn't mean God is not working. He is working. That's why you're uncomfortable. Stand in faith. Stand patiently and say, I am standing right here, God. Even if you shake into your bones, you stand in faith and say, I'm moving. Because I know what you told me, God. And I'm not settling for nothing. I want what you told me. Oh, my goodness. So if you let patience work in you, the end result is always good. You're always going to end up right. Let me just say this. Oh, my God about patience there are times god is going to assign you to do something that is going to be a utter failure in your eyes you're going to say oh my god 
I know you told me to do that spirit. And everything went to the left. And what are you going to say? See, I know that wasn't God because it should have worked out on my behalf. It did work out on your behalf because God just wanted you to be obedient. Because see, what in the perfect example was a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jennifer back in Children Church. She was a little spazzed out because of what happened back there. And she left thinking she was an utter failure. But it revealed to us some things we weren't prepared for. So her failure was a success because now when it happens again, we know how to deal with it. You follow me? So sometimes you're going to do something. You're going to say, I messed this all the way up. But I know God told me to do this. And now you have to wrestle with yourself and say, oh, my God, Lord, please forgive me. I, I, whatever I did, however I did it wrong, please forgive me. God said, you didn't do it wrong. I just asked you to be obedient. I didn't ask you to be right, wrong, and different. I just wanted you to do what I tell you to do. Now, when he tells you to do that, see, cousin spirit almost get me. You can't do it halfway, so you already know what word was coming. You have to give it your all and do it with a spirit of excellence. <laughs> Y'all follow me? Because your character is on the line. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So let me close with this. Patient is the ability to tolerate delay, endure difficulty, and show forbearance with others. This wasn't something we was born with. We wasn't born with patience. We actually, we was born quite the opposite. Very selfish. Because if you ask the yonder right now, that baby don't care if she's sleepy, sick, whatever. He just want what he wants. When he poops, when he poops, he doesn't care if you don't want to change the diaper. He just said, Pfft. am I right? Because they're selfish. That's how we were born. So we weren't born with patience. You have to work at patience. You have to teach yourself to be patient. You have to tell yourself to slow down. It, uh, you, well, Spirit going to tell me to slow down. Spirit already told you to slow down. You're going 85 miles an hour. You slow down to 55, but he wanted you at 25. You follow me? You have to teach yourself what patient is, what you should do, how you should move, when I should move. And if you have your focus, it'll be clear for you all the way through. And the effort you're putting in will cause you to have reserve energy in your tanks because you don't have to use all the effort because you're doing it all the time. Now you got some reserve tanks left over. So when you meet to the, get to the prize, you can celebrate. Yeah, who you just ran a marathon, girl? I know. Who? Let's go out to eat. For most church folk, when we finish the race, girl, I got to sit down somewhere for a week because I ran myself to No. When God bless you, he's trying to bless you to enjoy it. Are y'all with me? So patience begins the way you think. So change the way you think. And you develop patience. Change the way... It's not, everything is not a right now. Some things you have to tell yourself, not today, not right now. Slow down. Sometimes when I'm driving, I'm driving, ooh, isn't that a beautiful sky? She said, if you don't drive. Because my mind's all over the place. And sometimes I have to tell myself, okay, stop thinking about it. you getting crazy with your thoughts. Stop, slow down, bring yourself, bring it back in order. Get yourself together. You have to do this. You have to practice this. Tell somebody you got to practice. And when you put all of this together, you will become obedient. 
It may not look like your obedience is paying off, but it is. Don't get tired. It nobody may recognize your everyday obedience. God does. And I'm gonna use Sister Deborah as an example. She comes and she cleans this church from top to bottom. You walk in here and you can do surgery on the floor. You understand what I'm saying? To anybody who comes to church on Sunday morning, say, hey man, I don't know who cleaned that bathroom, but they sure clean that bathroom. Are you just going to the bathroom and say, ooh, it's nice in here. <laughs> Come on. So it's not that her job is going without thanking. It is, the, everybody's very happy when they go in those bathrooms and say, you who is clean in here. And it smells good. So we are actually thanking for her job. But when you lose focus, you will think nobody cares. We care. God cares. And your labor of love will not go in vain. You just got to be patient. Tell somebody, be obedient. Keep doing it. Even when nobody else is doing it, you keep doing what you're supposed to do. Keep doing it. And God is going to bless you. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God bless you.